والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم الله knows what's best for us so why should we complain we always want the sunshine but he knows there must be rain we always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer but our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear so whenever we feel that everything's going wrong it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh welcome to your show inspirations this is the live episode that we decided to have every two months insha'Allah all praises due to Allah we praise him we seek his aid and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evils of our actions whomsoever Allah guides none can lead astray and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray none can guide I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah alone who has no partners and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. Welcome to a new episode of Inspirations and as you can see this is the live episode that we decided to have every other month hopefully just to allow more uh, uh, participation from our viewers just to allow you to have more of your comments heard and uh, just to be able to open a channel where your comments can reach us directly we do appreciate the emails you've sent us so far and some of your questions and we do apologize for the late replies but still sometimes it's a huge number of emails that we're trying to deal with and we try to our best to benefit from every email so don't think that if you are not or your emails are not answered yet that they were not read no they were taken seriously and inshallah whenever we get the time we will try to provide a proper reply for each email so may Allah reward you for your assistance and your help uh, as usual every time I spend some time away from recording these shows and I come back to talk about the wonderful life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam this wonderful character I just can't help uh, stopping uh, asking the question is how much have I ben benefited from studying the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam does it have an impact on me as a person how much did it change in my life, in my personal attitude, in my outlook uh, on this life, in the way I see myself, the way I see uh, our existence here in this world and our mission and our obligations and our responsibility? What are the goals that we want to achieve in this life? If this study of the life of Muhammad hasn't affected us, then we have to seriously recheck ourselves and see where we went wrong. Because the study of the life of Muhammad وسلم, is meant to be an eye-opener, is meant to serve as an uh, assistant tool to help us emulate and follow the example of Muhammad وسلم, in all our affairs because there are so many lessons to be learned from his life. And I believe this has become evident from what we have studied of the life of Muhammad There are so many lessons to be learned, so many things to be introduced into our lives and they will obviously in, uh, increase and they will uh, ri raise high the quality of the life that we live. So you are all invited to share us in this ambition and in this goal. And hopefully, actually this is one of the main reasons why we chose to talk about the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu in this series of inspirations. Uh, obviously as the show is live today, you can call us, you can call in. Uh, the numbers will appear on the screen inshallah so you can call us on these uh, numbers and you are all welcome to have your share to have your imp input in this show and we would like to hear from you and as usual you can still write to us on our email address which is inspirations at huda.tv our email address again is inspirations at huda 
www.ghanimedia.tv. Last time we talked about, or we closed by mentioning a very important incident when there was uh, a person or the chief of a Jewish tribe, the tribe of Banu Nadir. Banu Nadir who were living uh, to the west of Medina. That was their locality or their vicinity. And uh, their chief was uh, called Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. He was a very famous man, a very strong fighter as well, very well known for his bravery. Yet, he was also known for his good poetry. And poetry at the time served as the strongest uh, form of, me of media and propagation. So uh, a poem would be said by a poet then within a few days it will travel and would spread all around the Arabian Peninsula. And actually poetry had the power among the Arabs to wage wars between tribes and it had also the power to subdue and put to an end some of the great and the famous uh, wars that took place among these tribes. So uh, this was a very high position that poetry occupied in the lives of the Arabs. It was even stronger than the media that we have today. It had such an influence on the people that they would take anything said in poetry, in, in poetry format, they would take that for granted and never question it. So the poets had the ability to change the opinions of masses. This is something that we have to understand. This is a, a specific thing to that time and to that era in the Arabian Peninsula. If you made, or if someone made or said an, uh, a poem, they could really change the attitude of a whole tribe. Some of the news that came to us from the times of Al-Jahiliyyah tell us clearly that there was one tribe who felt so proud about their origin and they thought they were superior to the rest of the Arabs. And then one poet spoke about them and he described them in only one line of poetry. And he said, basically in Arabic, the, the second part of his line was, Jismul Bighali wa Ahlamul Asafiri. He said, they had, or they had the bodies, the huge bodies of mule. So it means physically they were strong. But in terms of intelligence, in terms of reason, they had no brains whatsoever. He said they, were, they had the brains of birds. They were so light-minded. And actually, that line of poetry had the power to subdue that arrogance the tribe had. And they had, actually, their reputation deteriorated based on one line of poetry. This is something recorded in history. So poetry at that time was very powerful and it could change Actually, it played a major role in politics, and it, could, it had the power to change the balance of power at that time. So this is something we have to understand. Going back to Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, as the Muslims started to grow stronger, and as they managed to uh, defeat the people of Quraysh in the Battle of Badr, and this was something unexpected by all parties. It, was, it came as a surprise to everybody especially the Jews in Medina, who were really so, who had hanged so much hopes that the Battle of Badr would be the end of the Muslims. But it turned out to be the opposite. It gave and it added so much to the power and the reputation of the Muslims in the, in the Arabian Peninsula. Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf decided to use another style of war again, or combat against the Muslims. So he started saying poetry or making poetry against the Muslims, ridiculing the Prophet wasallam, making fun of the Muslims and the Muslim women, uh, and also inciting, and that was the most dangerous, politically speaking, he started inciting the Arab tribes all around the Arabian Peninsula against the Muslims, claiming that the Muslims will destroy the heritage of the Arabs, and that the Muslims were there to destroy all the traditions of the Arabs there and they wanted to turn it into something opposite to the Arabness of the Arabs at that time. This was the poetry. So it was basically incitement of hatred as we call it today. And it was considered by the Muslims as a heinous crime because yes, the Muslims made a victory or won a victory in the Battle of Badr. But still, the Muslims were surrounded by very big and huge tribes who were laying in wait for any opportunity to jump on the Muslims because 
after the Battle of Badr, they all, they all saw in the Muslims a great and a real threat to their existence and to their tradition. The people of Quraysh as well contributed so much to that because when they were defeated, they spread the news around in the, uh, uh, among the Arabs that these people, the Muslims, want to destroy our heritage and our tradition. Uh, Ka'b ibn Ashraf took real advantage of that, started to incite all the tribes against the Muslims. And actually, you could see some of the fruits of that, uh, or the Muslims could see some of the fruits of that Conta contagious enmity spreading among the Arabs. And that was a serious situation. The Muslims won the Battle of Badr, but they didn't have the power or the equipment or the numbers to be able to face any attack from outside from any of the major tribes. So the Muslims were in a real serious threat. And actually, some of the tribes like Ghatafan, the big tribes like Ghatafan, uh, some of them like Hawazin and other tribes, they were really considering attacking Medina at any stage. And that meant a serious threat even to the existence of Islam and Muslims. And as that, the situation aggravated and Ka'b al-Ashraf took full advantage of the tolerance of the Prophet wasallam, And obviously, he was advised to give up that approach, but he never listened to that. Actually, it increased him in his arrogance and in that thing. And as we see today, you know, just uh, two days ago, the uh, America or the USA is about now, they are about to make a law regarding or incriminating any satellite service provider, those who provide services to satellite channels incriminating them if they provide service to any of the channels that incites hatred against the Americans or they display a discourse that will lead to the killing of any Americans. Now that was exactly what happened. Unfortunately, this is not justly put because when you talk about terrorism, America now is using open terms. When you talk about terrorism, when you talk about violence, and when you talk about inciting hatred, these are very vague and hazy concepts. What do you mean by terrorism? And we know that there is no agreement, no consent about, no consensus about the meaning of this of this uh, of this word. And this is actually meant to be the case. The case is meant to be like that. So anyone who wants to use it, they can use it the way they want. So, at that time as well, using the media to incite hatred against Muslims and to incite hatred or incite the other tribes to attack the Muslims, that really was on the verge of creating real, actually floods of blood, real bloodshed between the Muslims and, uh, and others. So, and the problem is, many times when wars take place, when they are political wars, and actually they are, these wars are not... Uh, meant for the benefit of the people of both parties, of both countries. It's just a problem that takes place between the, say, the head of state of this country or that nation and the head state of that country. And they sacrifice their own people and their own soldiers for the sake of a political disagreement or political war. And the innocent people get murdered. But those political leaders are always in a safe haven from that or the, out from the consequences of this, of such wars. And the Prophet ﷺ understood this. He realized that the majority of the Jews there, they did not want to fight the Muslims themselves. They didn't want to get involved in that. And the majority of the tribes of the Arabs, the normal people, the average people, they didn't really want to get into a war against Muslims because it didn't bring about, or it wouldn't bring about any fruits. But... What would happen, some of the leaders, the chief of, chiefs of tribes, they could, be really f they could really feel some kind of a threat to their leadership from Muhammad wasallam. So they would put their people into a war, an unjustified war against the Muslims and get so much bloodshed just because of selfish reasons and motivations. The Prophet ﷺ understood the situation like that. He realized that any enmity against the Muslims that could be incited through the poetry of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf 
was not justified by any means. It was only chiefs of tribes that did not want to give up their positions or just felt some kind of threat to their personal possession. position. So the Prophet ﷺ decided to deal with it in a different way. So he sent some of the Muslims who put an end to all this conspiracy. The problem was emanating from one person. There was no serious problem between the Muslims and the rest of the Arabs. Apart from Quraysh, obviously. There was no serious problem between the Muslims, between Islam, and the general Jews. The Jews who were living there around Medina. Yes, they did not like Islam, they didn't want Islam, but they were not ready to fight Islam as... Gen as the, I'm talking about the general people, but their leaders were actually burning as they saw Islam prosper. The Prophet ﷺ realized that and he decided to put an end to that war waged against Islam through the media. So the Prophet ﷺ sent those people to get rid of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. Yes, some people might say that Islam is legislating assassination. No, Islam does not uh, legislate assassination, but there are exceptions. When it means to uh, prevent or put an end to bloodshed, sac sacrificing one person, who has incited all this hatred which was non-existent before, then you get rid of the source of that problem and you save the people and let, let them live in peace and in harmony. That was the wisdom behind that. And also, this was not done on a personal basis. It was done by the command of the, uh, the leader of the state of the Muslims, the Prophet wasallam. And obviously, as this was the Prophet's style, this was done after consultation and very careful planning. Now we will see inshallah again what happened after that, especially with the people living in Medina, what happened, what happened between them and the Muslims after the short break. Stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. The deeds are bound by its intentions. The deeds that we do, we have to have a sincere intentions that we're doing it only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have the best definitions of things, the right vision, the criteria in which we would get to know what is right and what is wrong through the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu The tafsir of the Quran is to explain, is to interpret the best words, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muslims in particular will uh, have very good knowledge of Islamic religion and Islamic law and then will run their lives according to the injunctions of Allah. It will enable them to know how to live peacefully with them and at the same time practice Islamic religion or follow the injunctions of Allah as requested and required by the Allah. <laughs> Just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. Uh, we just closed before the break by saying that sometimes certain things are not accepted, but when it gets to that tolerance being exploited and where it really jeopardizes people's lives and creates enmity amongst people, then the root of the problem has to be dealt with decisively. 
And that was exactly what happened with Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. Actually, next day, the Jews of Banu al-Nadir, they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they complained. They said, you know, our chief was killed last night. The Prophet ﷺ sat them down. He said, okay, sit down. He started relating to them some of the poetry of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. They felt so embarrassed. They felt indicted because of that ugly were language because of that uh, incitement uh, to hatred because of that uh, discourse based on, based on hatred and inciting others to attack the Muslims they realized that he made a heinous and serious crime now the Prophet ﷺ did something very intelligent very clever with those Jews when they came uh, I'll talk about it after we take a phone call we have sister Ilham from Syria Salam alaikum sister <laughs> welcome to the show First of all, may Allah reward you for your efforts. We've really been benefited from this show. And I ask Allah to help us to apply and implement what we learn. Thank you very much. Amen. I was actually very affected when we talked about the captives and how Muslims dealt with them. And whether those captives believed or not, the Muslims did their best with planting the seeds of goodness in their hearts. And they were not responsible about this, the fruit. But unfortunately, now we are not good ambassadors for Islam. We are hard with our own Muslims, brothers and sisters. We are waiting each other. I heard about a person who embraced Islam, and then when he dealt with Muslims, he said, Alhamdulillah that I knew Islam before I knew Muslims. Because if I knew Muslims before I knew Islam, I would not, I would not have believed in the religion of such people. So we have to be so careful to not to commit sins in the name of Islam. Because if anybody decided not to embrace Islam because of our manner, although it is not a good excuse for him, yet we will not be free from holding responsibility. Now, let me talk about Osman bin Affan and his total ob obedience to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. He didn't argue with him when he commanded him to look after Medina. He could have said, O Messenger of Allah, it is not my job. Let me go, go with you and fight to get the reward. He knew that by obeying the Prophet, he will have the same reward. And as long as everybody is fulfilling his duties, the society is organized. And that was the case of the, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But now everything is upside down. No one wants to carry out the job that Allah commands him or her to carry. Everybody now likes to take the role of the other. That's why we are not an organized society. True. For example... Women today can be seen everywhere except at their houses. They like to, to take the job of men. But how come? Who will look after the house and bring up the children in the best of ways? And let me give an example. <coughs> Your show, Inspirations, is very successful, mashallah. Because each one of Inspirations' team is fulfilling his job. Thank you. you are the presenter, we have the producer, the director, the cameraman, and so on. So everybody is in his right way. Now imagine if those people decided to share their presentation with you in front of the camera. Even the cameraman decided to do that. Then who will hold the camera? Who will be the director, producer? Then we will not enjoy watching inspirations anymore. Each one of you is doing a great job. And no one should take the job of the other. And this is how the Muslim woman should understand their role. Their job is behind the screen and it is appreciated. You know, brother, that we, we have been deceived by media, which makes men want to be like women, and women want to be like men. And by repeating this idea, and as you said, that repeating the idea is one of the media ways to deceive people. By that, the, mad me the mass media in the modern society manip manipulates people in a blind way. So for both men and women, please do not be deceived by them, and do not be blind followers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, mashallah. Very, very nice analogy, to be honest. Very nice analogy. And actually, you, you made the cameraman uh, really f uh, feel that. You made them embarrassed. But that's true. That's true. And I really thank you for this beautiful analogy because it really reveals the reality of what's happening today. Uh, we need to fill different positions. We have to complement each other. This is how we can make a perfect job. But if all of us want to do just one thing, and we insist on uh, one position, obviously th things are not going to work out. Uh, I really thank you so much, mashallah. Uh, very useful analogy, and hopefully we can use that, uh, especially when it comes to the great job and the great uh, mission that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted our women with, our sisters, our mothers, and our daughters, and our wives. 
with because they are doing such a wonderful mission when they bring up their children in the best of ways. And every time, I would like to share this personal experience with you. Day in, day out, I become more convinced, more convinced that the best and the most noble mission, the most noble task a human being could ever do is to help raise the younger generation in the best of ways. This is the key to a prosperous Ummah. But imagine, most of us are running away from that. And it's the, one of the most difficult jobs in the world, one of the most difficult tasks in the world, is to really be patient with children, with the younger generation, understand them, build their personalities in the right way, and also build their knowledge and prepare them for their time. This is one of the most difficult uh, missions that we could get involved in. Yet most people run away from it and it's the most noble. That was the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the mission of the mother and the father. It's maybe more like so with the mother because the father has to go out and make a living. And no one really has the talents of a, de of a devout mother who has devoted her time and her life to bring up her children in the best of ways. So I don't, I don't really understand why many uh, of our sisters and many of our uh, wives don't realize that Allah has given you the most beautiful, the most noble job and you just run away from it. And the sister Elham from Syria gave us a very beautiful analogy. If everyone in the crew here just wanted to be in front of the camera, there will be no one to film, no one to direct, no one to make the lighting. That's it. There will be actually no production. It's very simple. This is, this is what's happening now. Uh, we'll uh, take another phone, uh, phone call from KSA. We have sister Asya. Assalamu alaikum, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Welcome to the show. Yeah. How are you, Shay? Alhamdulillah. Jazakum Allah khair. May Allah bless you and your family. And you. May Allah reward you. Sheikh, uh, we Muslims are changed like those past situations when Islam was taking root by our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of our deviant, uh, some of our deviant brothers are helping Palestine while on those who are in Sunnah not, not, uh, not, uh, they are not showing that much help to them. In fact, the situation has reached that Israel has reached so going to make a temple also in Aqsa Museum. Uh, they say that they are from Ahl Sunnah, but they have lowered the wings with the disbelievers. disbelievers. Now, when such situation comes like about Menorah in Switzerland, about Hijab in France, and other situation, n nobody is taking any action in such situation. Uh, what what a common person like us? should do, to whom we should suppose, what should we guide, what what should we tell to our children, what should we guide to our children telling about which step, to whom to suppose. Uh, can you please come in? Thank you very much. Uh, actually, you hit a wound in the heart. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us and guide us to do what is best at this stage. I will come back to this, inshallah. But I, I will come back. To, I just want to comment on what Sister Ilham from Syria said about the captives. Just one incident I didn't mention was about uh, Mus'ab ibn Umair, his brother, his brother uh, Aziz, the brother of Mus'ab ibn Umair. Aziz ibn Umair was among the, uh, the mushrikeen, among the people of Quraysh in the Battle of Badr. He was taken captive. The one who took him captive was Mus'ab himself, his brother and another person from Al-Ansar, and they had to look after him. And when they heard how the Prophet ﷺ encouraged them to look after the captives, he says, I was surprised. I was surprised because they put me there, and they uh, kept a watch over me. And what happened, they would get some food. They used to get, uh, for example, bread and dates. Now the bread was very rare, so whenever they got some bread, that was a very special day. So they would take the dates to themselves, give the dates to themselves, and give me the bread, which was much better, which was considered much better at that time. They would eat dates every day, but a bet, uh, the bread would come once in a blue moon. So they, he said, when they received even bread, they gave it to me. So they gave me the food, and they 
the better food and they kept for themselves, you know, uh, just the usual food. So I felt so shy once. I just said, you know, no, you take your bread. They said, no, we are going to take care of our captives. That was the, uh, how Islam really treats even the enemies. This is something we have to spread so people get really to understand. I have a few events to talk about. Then I will comment on what Sister Asya uh, said. Actually, the Jews came to the Prophet ﷺ complaining about that. He sat them down and he narrated to them some of the poetry of Kaab ibn Ashraf. They felt so embarrassed and they felt indicted. The Prophet ﷺ said to them, as you are here now, we'll take advantage of that. We will make a covenant, an agreement, written agreement, that no one incites others against the other. We take care of each other. We have to protect each other when it comes to that. They agreed and they signed. But yet... The people of Banu Nadir, the people of Kaab al-Ashraf, they decided to fight the Prophet ﷺ. What did they do? Actually, what they did, they said to the Prophet ﷺ, you come to us with among 30 people of your companions, and we bring 30 of our rabbis. We meet in a place called Al-Mansafa in Medina. Uh, we meet there and we have some kind of a dialogue. If our rabbis are convinced with your message, then we will follow. We will follow you and follow our rabbis, and we will accept Islam. But if they don't, then we don't. Let's settle this. The Prophet ﷺ agreed, but yet, the Jews themselves said among, uh, they said to each other, how do you think that you will be kill, you can kill Muhammad ﷺ when you have 30 of his companions around? They would fight to death. You will not be able to do that. So they decided, they sent another messenger saying to the Prophet ﷺ, no, you just bring three of your companions and we will bring three rabbis because 60 people is too much to dialogue. So let's just keep it to three people on each side. The Prophet ﷺ understood what was happening. Some narrations mentioned that the news seeped, uh, or the, the, the news leaked from the, uh, from the Jews and came to the Muslims that they actually wanted to kill the Prophet ﷺ. They were, set, they were trying to set him up. The Prophet ﷺ didn't go there to that meeting. Next day, he got the Muslims all ready, and he went to the uh, fort of the people of the tribe of Banu Nadir. He sieged, he made a siege around them, and they fought for the day, but they couldn't break through. Then, and with them was Banu Quraidah. So the Prophet ﷺ next day went to Banu Quraidah, who, agree, who made an agreement with the Prophet ﷺ. They said, we give up. The Prophet ﷺ said to them, you stay there, but you don't have any weapons. You don't take any weapons. Then, he, uh, the Prophet ﷺ went back to Bani Nadir. They fought them until they decided to give up. And they agreed that the Muslims take their uh, weapons. And the Jews only take what their animals could carry. And they leave to Asham. And they did leave. To Asham, and actually they started breaking their homes and their property, so the Muslims don't benefit from it. But they were surprised when they saw that the Muslims themselves were even breaking that, giving them the message that it's not about this world, it's about the truth that we are fighting against you because you betrayed the agreement between that we had between each other. Then they were they went to uh, Asham, and this was the beginning of Al Hashr, as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed in Surah Al Hashr, that. Uh, the, uh, this tribe uh, was the beginning of the people being all driven towards Asham where people will be resurrected on the day uh, of judgment. Some other incidents happened. We will talk about them after I take this phone call from Sister Wafa from Egypt. Salam alaikum, Sister. Wa alaikum, Salam wa Welcome to the show. I do apologize for interrupting you, Sheikh. No, no, go ahead, please. You're welcome. Uh, um, it's uh, just uh, one more question. Uh, relating to the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as um, when I, I I'm really influenced by the stories of the muhajirin. When I read or listen about their sacrifices, um, how they gave up everything for the sake of Allah, their wealth, their families, their uh, properties, um, I often ask myself, um, if I was if I were there at that time. With my state which I am in today, I, I, I think I would be counted among the, the hypocrites. Uh, I, 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 I feel that we are not tested uh, uh, yet. Um, uh, of course, uh, nobody wished to be tested or to be tried, but um, I, I want to know 
how can we test ourselves to know whether we are true believers or not, to know our sincerity, to know our uh, our faith, whether it's, uh, we are right or wrong. I, I don't know uh, whether it's right or wrong to ask such questions, but I really want to know the answer. Thank you very much, Sister Wafa. Uh, it's, it's a valid question, and it actually occurs to many brothers and many sisters. And the nature of the time in which we live really sometimes necessitates or just forces such questions. And uh, I will try to deal with this question towards the end of the show. Just I need to finish with some of the events here, very important events. And inshallah, I will try to highlight or give an answer to the question of... Uh, uh, to both questions that we received from uh, our viewers, from Sister uh, Asia and from Sister Wafa. Uh, so basically the, the people of Banu Nadir were expelled to Asham and they had to give up their weapons and they left and they carried what they could and the, uh, actually some of the, the Muslims started even to cut some of the palm trees because they received a command to cut down the palm trees. Then they stopped and they went to ask the Prophet Sallallahu is it alright that we cut some of the palm trees? Imagine at the time of war, they're even asking about cutting down palm trees. It shows that the Muslim is sensitive towards everything. Everything the Muslim does needs guidance with it. Imagine, many people would say, well, it's just palm trees, no problem, you've cut it. No, but they went back to the Prophet Sallallahu to seek guidance. This is the way the Prophet ﷺ cultivated the companions, that they are careful about everything they, they do. It has to be on the true path. It has to be done for a justified reason. So the Prophet ﷺ told them, or the verse from Allah ﷻ came, whatever you have cut, then you have cut. Stop cutting the rest, keep the rest. And it all happened by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically, this was the case. We will move on to other events after the short break. Stay tuned. Is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Islam. Anyone who chooses other than Al Islam as a religion, as a way, it won't be accepted from him. This Qur'an has to be understood by the way the companions of Rasulullah understood the Qur'an. We disconnect ourselves from the actions of certain Muslims who oppress people and kill people unjustly. have informed us that we should not obey no one on the account of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the superiority is to Allah's command. So if the husband tells his wife that I want you to check hands with my colleagues, with my business partners, no. Even if it leads to divorce. If the husband says to his wife that you have to party with me, with partners and so on, no. You have to take your hijab off, no. By any means communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows your language and he will be very happy to answer your prayer. Just Allah's way to make our spirits strong.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. This is the live episode that we decided to have every other month. And just before the break, uh, we finished with the story of Banu Nadir and how they were uh, actually sent out of the uh, out of Medina and they went to Asham. Uh, some of the things happened after the Battle of Badr. Some beautiful social things that happened. Uh, I will, I decide, I, inshallah, will talk about them maybe in two months when we have another live episode. Uh, because they really highlight some of the beautiful aspects of the social life in the Muslim community. Uh, Umar ibn Khattab, the way he was looking for a wife, for a husband, for his daughter, Hafsa. And it really has, there are so many lessons we can derive from that but because we don't have the time today. We will leave it for next, the next live episode, inshallah. Uh, we, I just have to state that the Prophet ﷺ did marry Uthman Ra'afan to his second daughter, Umm Kulthum, because Ruqayya died uh, just at the time of the Battle of Badr. And the Prophet ﷺ decided to marry Umm Kulthum to Uthman and this is why he came to be called the Nurain, the person with two lights, because he married two of the daughters of the Prophet Some interesting events happened that really led to the, uh, eventually to the prohibition of alcohol, and we will deal with the issue of the prohibition of alcohol later on. But I will save those other incidents as well that had to do with uh, alcohol to another time, although they actually happened after the battle of Badr and before the battle of Uhud, uh, but it seems that we will have to uh, leave that for some time later. Uh, okay, before I answer the question of the sisters who asked the questions, I'll take a phone call from Libya. We have Abu Ahmed. Salam alaikum. From Yemen. From Yemen. Welcome, Akhi Abu Ahmed. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask a question that's been on my mind lately. Yes, go ahead. Well, uh, my dad and his nephews have been having a couple of problems, uh, so much so even me with my cousin. Uh, what happened is in 2000, we uh, split them. I, 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 I can't hear that. You're breaking up and the line is not that clear. Can you repeat your question, Brother Abu Ahmed? Okay, did we, did we lose the brother? Okay, no problem. Brother, if you can call us again, inshallah, we will try to answer your question. Just uh, dealing with the question of Sister Umm Asia about what's happening generally to the Muslim Ummah. And uh, uh, at these times, Muslims in Palestine, what's happening in Europe now, like... Uh, banning the minarets in Switzerland and everything, regardless of uh, the issue of minarets. But there is a general attitude that is gaining more po uh, popularity and more power in the West. And it is a result of the negative media about Islam, even perpetuated by some Muslims. So... How can we deal with that? I believe this is only the beginning and there will be much more. I'm really so apprehensive that there will be much more. It's only the beginning. And the problem is that we Muslims have failed to give a true image of what Islam is, even in the West. Muslims living in the West and Muslims living in Muslim countries, they have, I believe, we have failed to some degree to present the real image of Islam and we have left the arena open, we have given a full play to the enemies of Islam, to manage to instill in people's minds the wrong image about Islam through the media and through other avenues. So we are to blame somehow we, uh, for a great deal of what has happened. And uh, I believe we have to really deal with the issue uh, at a much deeper level. We have to see how we understand Islam, how we implement it and how we practice it, because that's the bottom line. And I have a, a conviction that even uh, with the great issues that are happening now, the urgent issues, what's happening to Muslims in Palestine, what's happening to Muslims in Iraq, in Afghanistan, Chechnya, uh, in uh, the Philippines, different, different parts, around Kashmir, different parts around the world, what's happening to Muslims, these are urgent situations, yes. 
But most of us only focus on these urgent situations without seeing the underlying roots of the problem. We're not seeing our own mistakes, we're not seeing our, the damage we are causing by keeping away from practicing Islam. Many Muslims now just sit watching TV, looking at what's happening, you know, watching the news, following the news, and having a sense of fulfillment, having a self of achievement, just because they are casting the blame on the rulers, casting the blame on the Muslim masses, casting the blame on the enemies of Islam. But what have you done? Imagine some people have been doing the same for 30, 40 years, just sitting and lashing ourselves about what's happening. Look at them. Have you done any practical thing? Your children are being taken captive by the TV shows that are destructive, by the music, by the uh, pop music, by the rock music, by all these destructive elements, even the cartoons that our children see are destroying us from inside and destroying our younger generation. And we are so oblivious, so ignorant about that, and we just focus our attention on following the news. You don't need to know all the details on the news. Just understand, follow the news of the Muslims. You, it's an obligation to see what's happening to the Muslims, to feel their pain, and so that to give you the motivation to go deep into yourself and deal with the important things that have the potential to change the conditions and the situation of the Muslims. It's, we can speak for hours about what will really change us, what will really help the situation of the Muslims. But that's a long story and we should actually continuously talk about that and repeatedly so that we get to understand it. But unfortunately, we don't see the connection between practicing Islam and being loyal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being obedient to Allah and what's happening today. Most people see it on a material basis, from a material perspective. That this is happening because we don't help the people in Palestine. That's true. But there is a much deeper level that what is happening is because the Muslims have turned away from the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously not entirely, but look at the state of the Muslims. Many people just pray and think that's too much to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't look after their children. They neglect their obligations to Allah in so many fields, so many aspects. We have to take these things seriously. I can't really just put everything you know, in a nutshell. It's a very long process, but what we should remind ourselves that وَمَن نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Victory, dominance comes from Allah. So once we really understand Islam and implement it and spread it, and this is obviously a long process, things will not heal in one or two years. Never. It takes a longer time. It takes planning. It takes putting trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It takes so many elements. But basically we have to study our religion, understand it and implement it and bring up our genera younger generations based on that pure Islam. And then it will, we will be empowered inshaAllah because the help of Allah will be with us. This is trying to put things in a nutshell. Hopefully this would help. Uh, the question of Sister Wafa about what we can do or we have not been tested and we don't uh, we see ourselves so far uh, you know too far from the example of the companions i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us on islam keep us on the right path but don't forget the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said one day that there will come generations the person who holds on you know uh, a tenth of what you hold, as far as I remember, a tenth of what you hold on, then they will pass, or they will make it to paradise. And the Prophet ﷺ said, in a very authentic hadith, that the people who will remain on Islam in those days, they will get 50, uh, you know, 50 times the reward one of you will get. Why? Because yes, we, we will not get to the level of the companions, but we are supposed to follow their example. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us, or will hold us responsible for what we are able to do. Generally to be, uh, try to keep ourselves from hypocrisy, what we do say, if you notice that in public you do your acts of worship, and you do righteous deeds better than you do them in private, there's a serious problem, you have to address it. Okay, this is something very important, but generally speaking, try to hold on to authentic Islam, which is the Qur'an and the Sunnah, according to the understanding of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu or the understanding of the early generations. Hold on to the well-known scholars, 
who are known for this methodology, this authentic Islam, hold on to their understanding, try to follow, uh, take guidance from them, try to do everything you can do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I can't say anything more than that. But we can't compare ourselves to the companions because they were chosen by Allah to be the companions of the Prophet sallallahu as Ibn Mas'ud said. So we should strive to emulate and follow their example and hopefully we will be on their way and hopefully we will be from among those that Allah will give multiple reward up to 50 times over as the companions. Uh, inshallah, we will meet next week and talk more about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu taking more lessons. And I thank you for your participation, for your calls and for your emails. Until we meet another time, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us So why should we complain? We always want the sunshine But He knows there must be rain We always want the laughter And the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong And the merriment of cheer but our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong